As we open God's word together, let's ask him to bless it to us. Let's pray. Eternal Father, who has spoken in various times and in various ways to your people in the past, but in these last days in your Son, the incarnate word, we pray that you will open the mouth of your servant to proclaim that word in the power of the Spirit. We pray that this same Spirit will open the hearts of its hearers here assembled to receive your holy gospel and write on their hearts your holy law, even as you have promised. All of this, gracious Father, we ask you in the name of Jesus Christ and all God's people said, Amen. Please be seated. And please turn with me in God's word to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians if you're visiting with us, we're considering a series together through the book of 1 Thessalonians, and we've come to chapter 2, and we're going to read together the first 12 verses of chapter 2. So 1 Thessalonians, beginning our reading at chapter 2, verse 1, and let's pay careful attention, for this is God's own word. For you yourselves know, brothers, that our coming to you was not in vain. But though we had already suffered and been shamefully treated at, at Philippi, as you know, we had boldness in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in the midst of much conflict. For our appeal does not spring from error or impurity or any attempt to deceive, but just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak, not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. For we never came with words of flattery, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, whether from you or from others, though we could have made demands as apostles of Christ. But we were gentle among you, like a nursing mother taking care of her own children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves, because you had become very dear to us. For you remember, brothers, our labor and toil. We work night and day that we might not be a burden to any of you while we proclaim to you the gospel of God. You are witnesses, and God also, how holy and righteous and blameless was our conduct toward you believers. For you know how, like a father with his children, we exhorted each one of you and encouraged you and charged you to walk in a manner worthy of God who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. Thus far the reading of God's word. May he bless it to us. Well, probably all of us who have email addresses have from time to time received scam emails. Uh, you maybe have all received emails from Nigerian royalty uh, promising you millions of dollars that they want to deposit in your account, and all you need to do is pass along, along your bank information. Um, and, and we become so used to these things that we, we spot scams pretty quickly now, um, and we know that we have to be on guard for those kinds of things when they come to us uh, over the Internet. Of course, in Paul's day, they didn't have the internet. If you didn't know that, you can write it down. Um, in his day, they didn't have internet. That's not how scam artists worked back then. Scam artists showed up in person. Uh, they worked their scams personally before people. Um, and that's how con men in Paul's day worked. They would come personally. And a lot of that scheming was done by people who were masquerading as philosophers who had wisdom to share, um, or religious experts who had some kind of religious knowledge to share, and they would pass through town, um, and they would try to peddle their religion for profit, or peddle their philosophy for profit. And that was the world in which Paul lived. That was the world in which the apostles and the other ministers spreading the gospel of Christ, that was the world in which they were sharing the gospel. Now listen to how one scholar described the time of the apostle Paul. He said, there has probably never been such a variety of religious cults and philosophic systems as in Paul's day. East and West had united and intermingled to produce a combination of real piety, high moral principles, crude superstitions, and gross license. Eastern mysteries, Greek philosophy, 
and local godlings competed for favor under the tolerant aegis of Roman influence. Holy men of all creeds and countries, popular philosophers, magicians, astrologers, crackpots and cranks, the sincere and the spurious, the religious and the rogue, swindlers and saints jostled and clamored for the attention of the credulous and the skeptical. You might say, that doesn't sound like first century Rome, that sounds like 21st century America. Um, yeah, maybe not much, much has changed. There is a lot of that going around. And of course, that was one of the challenges for Paul in his missionary work, to not come across the people as another one of these charlatans. Uh, to not come across the people as a crank or a crackpot, someone selling something, peddling something for their own profit. And this was particularly important to talk to the Thessalonians about because they, were, they would be right at the intersecting point of this kind of world. We talked last time, they were one of the major seaports um, on the Mediterranean. They were the capital of the province of Macedonia. So they had a lot of boat traffic coming through. And so a lot of people, if they were coming through peddling some weird system, would come through by sea or they would come through by land. It was also on one of the major highways um, of the Roman Empire, uh, the Via Ignatia, or if you want to pronounce it like a Roman, a via, the Via Ignatia. Um, this is the important insights you come to church to gather, uh, Roman pronunciation. Uh, but this was a major highway on which people traveled. So you can imagine if you're on a major seaport where everybody's passing through and on a major road where everybody's passing through, you're probably seeing a lot more of this passing through than other places would. And you can imagine that Paul and his fellow ministers had the challenge of showing people we're not part of this kind of ministry. We're not the cranks who are following through for their own profit. And you can imagine that they probably got criticized by people as being that very thing. And so oftentimes Paul and his fellow ministers would write to defend their ministry against those who were attacking them against those who would try to say of them, they are more swindlers than saints. And so Paul is reminding the church of what they saw from him and from those other gospel ministries. And so that's what really what this passage is about, Paul defending his ministry against the criticisms that are being raised against the ministry of Paul and Silas and Timothy. Um, and so in defense of his ministry, what does Paul point to here? Um, well, he points to three things in particular that they should take note of. First, the effective proclamation that his ministry to them was not in vain. Secondly, their pure motivation, that they were motivated by nothing but godly motives in coming to this people. And the righteous exertion, the labor that they extended on behalf of this church. That's what we want to think about this passage. Paul defends their ministry in terms of effective proclamation, pure motivation, and righteous exertion. Uh, Paul defends his ministry first by pointing to that effective proclamation that was achieved through their work. Uh, throughout, you'll notice that throughout the defense of his ministry, Paul will over and over again point to things that they know or that they remember. Um, he's not trying to sketch things out of whole cloth. He says, you know these things, you remember these things, you saw these things, you were witnesses to all of this. I'm really just reminding you of the things you know. He says that in verse, verses 1 and 2, verse 5, verse 9, verse 11. He keeps coming back to that theme. These are things you know. I'm just reminding you of things you can remember if you think of to our ministry among you. And it seems like one of the criticisms that was being raised against their ministry was this. Things actually were going pretty well for us until you came. We were worshiping God in the synagogue. Um, we were gathering in the synagogue and, and worshiping the true and living God. And people were, by and large, letting us alone to do it. Um, we weren't suffering from the governing authorities. They, they were content to tolerate that. And you can imagine how people came and say, how effective was this ministry among you? Before they came, life was a lot easier for you. But after they go away, you as Christians are now su subject to persecution, not just from the governing authorities who don't like the world being turned upside down, but also from 
the people who you used to go to the synagogue with, who now see you as a betrayer, uh, who now see you as walking and following after some strange way. And you can say how the, you see how they could come to these people and say, has that gospel really been effective for you? Has it really paid off for you to follow this Jesus? Weren't you doing better before the gospel came? Look at all the suffering and turmoil you're dealing with. And so Paul wants to remind them that he came and it was effective. That the ministry was not in vain. And that Paul ministered among them and, the, and Silas and Timothy too to their great prophet. And, and Paul begins by saying, you know, it wasn't like we came to you apart from suffering and apart from difficulty. Paul had come to, to Thessalonica after being in Philippi. And if you go back to Acts 16 and remember what happened to Paul and Silas in Philippi, they were beaten, they were imprisoned, uh, they tried to run them out of town until they found out Paul was a Roman citizen and then they were afraid for themselves, but they still asked him to leave. It wasn't like they had an easy time in Philippi. And Paul said, you know, we very easily could have limped into town here sort of gun-shy about preaching. But Paul said, you know, we didn't do that. When we came here, we preached to you with boldness, and it was God-grounded boldness. They were not put off by what happened to them in Philippi, even though the same happened to them in Thessalonica. They were run out of town there too. But he said, you know, we continued to speak with God-grounded boldness, despite the opposition we met in Thessalonica. He said, we declared the gospel in the midst of much conflict, but it didn't change our boldness to share the gospel. It didn't change our boldness to share the gospel. And that was a boldness that was worked in us from our God. They were not just bold, they were bold in God. They were confident that God, God's work is not done in vain. Right? We were not just bold. Paul's not bragging on himself. He says, we, were, we had boldness in our God. We knew that he did not send us places in vain, even when we were run out of town. Because you'll notice they got run out of town in Philippi, but there was still a church in Philippi when they were done. And they got run out of town in Thessalonica, but there was still a church in Thessalonica when they were done. That's what gave them boldness to minister. They were bold in our God. They knew that God had a plan. They knew that God was working through them, and it gave them boldness to do their work. They knew that God was working through them, and they know what they had to declare to the world. That they'd been given the gospel of God. And despite all that might have caused them to hold back, in preaching, all the circumstances of the world that would cause them strife and conflict. They knew they had boldness because they had a mission from God and they had something from God to declare to the world, and that was the gospel. They had the God grounded boldness to proclaim the God given gospel. That despite all of that conflict, they knew what they had to offer life, eternal life in Jesus Christ. And Paul said, we brought that God-given gospel through the boldness that was given to us by our God. And that preaching was not in vain. We came in boldness. We declared the gospel of Christ in the power of the Holy Spirit. And it was not in vain. Whenever it's done, it's not in vain. Preaching the gospel never has no point. It always accomplishes the purpose for which God has set it. And Paul said, don't listen to the people that said nothing was accomplished in the preaching of the gospel. You received eternal life in Christ's name when you believed in his name. And that's worth anything that we suffer here and now. Um, our work on behalf of God is never in vain. Now, this passage has a particular application to preachers. 
to remember to have that boldness in our God to preach our gospel. But there's only a hand few of us here that are ministers. Um, And so I hope we'll all, as ministers, take our cue from this, as seminary students take our cue from this, to always preach in boldness the God-given gospel. But what can we learn as Christians about this passage if we're not preachers of the gospel? Well, the first thing is if we want to be bold for the Lord Jesus Christ, we have to find our boldness in the Lord. You know, Paul was not naturally bold. Silas was not naturally bold. Timothy, we know, certainly was not naturally bold. Um, We know that Timothy suffered from his youth, had to be told not to let people despise your youth, Um, had to be told, you know, take a little wine for the sake of your stomach. You don't have the strongest constitution in the world. These guys were not constitutionally necessarily bold in and of themselves. They were bold in God. And if we recognize a certain lack of boldness in ourselves, the only way we can become bold is if God would give us the grace and help of his Holy Spirit. We probably all experience this to a certain extent when it comes to opportunities to talk to people about Jesus, to share the gospel. We've all experienced that lack of boldness. And what happens if I don't know what to say? Um, What happens if I kind of get caught out? I wish I could be bolder. Um, Well, make that your prayer. That God would give us the boldness to say the things that need to be said when they need to be said. And may we remember in those moments, too, what we have to share with the world. Um, One of the things that Paul ties together is boldness in our God, but a remembrance of what we have to give the world. This world is dying. This world is dead for lack of a knowledge of God. And everything that's wrong in this world flows from that fountain. Um, And there's all kinds of voices telling us how we should be bold about fixing the problems of our world. But really, if we want to treat not just the symptoms, but the real problem, the answer lies in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the power of God to save sinners. That's the power of God to bring the dead to life. And that will help us not only to ask God for boldness, but to remember what it is that he's given to us. The thing that alone can make people live and can change lives, can turn people like Paul, persecutors of the church, into one of the most powerful servants of the church the chief of sinners, into one of the greatest pillars of the church. The gospel did that. The gospel still has that power. God's arm has not grown short. Remember what it is that we have. And may that give us encouragement for the church in this world. It can seem like the deck is so stacked against us that there's nothing we can accomplish. That everything we're doing is just in vain. You know, trying to, like we do at the beach sometimes as children, trying to build moats and things to protect our sandcastles when the tide is coming in. That's not the story of the church in the world. The story of the church in the world should be one of boldness because the gospel of God will triumph in the end. Because Christ has said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So Paul's saying, don't listen to those people who say our coming was in vain. Our coming was not in vain. It was in the power of the Holy Spirit, and it changed lives. And then Paul says, and don't listen to the people who tell you that we had selfish motives in coming. The second thing he points to is their pure motivation in coming uh, to the people of Thessalonica. That seems like another criticism that was raised against these missionaries, that they'd come with mixed motives. Um, and, and, And we can understand how that, criticism would come up. Um, There are certainly people we know from sad experience who use religion as a way to derive some personal benefit, whether it's wealth or sex or power or prestige. People misuse religion for all sorts of personal ways, and it seems like there were some who were questioning the motives of Paul and his fellow missionaries. That's why Paul argues in verses 4 through 8 that their motives were pure, Their motives were not mixed. Their motives were not selfish. Their motives were pure in coming to the Thessalonians. And their their motives were just 
the two motives that should always be there for the people of God. Why do we do things for God? Well, to please God and to benefit God's people. Paul says that's all we were about in coming to you. We sought to please God and we sought to benefit his people. Paul says everything that his preaching was not in verse 4. It was not from error. It was not from impurity. It was not from any attempt to deceive. He said, we didn't say anything that we didn't understand or that we were confused about. We taught you the pure truth. We were not motivated by any kind of impurity. Paul, I think, here has in mind particular that moral impurity that is involved with sexual sin to try to manipulate anybody in the church. That's not why we preach the gospel. And we didn't do any attempt to deceive anyone. We only shared the truth. We could say in this defense that Paul says we were not confused or creepy or crafty. Our motives were pure in coming to you. We acted only in the first place to please God. Paul says we came as faithful servants. Verse 4, we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we speak not to please man, but to please God who tests our hearts. He can say, the Lord is witness what our motive was among you. And we came as workmen approved by God, entrusted with something precious to give to you, and we preached it to please him. We were approved by him. We were entrusted with his treasure. And so we spoke as approved and trusted servants. Not to please men, but to please God. In a sense to say, knowing that God would know our hearts. And that knowing that God knows our hearts. That what he thinks of us is all that matters. We do things to please God. Paul says that was our motivation. That too is a reminder to Christians. Why should we do the things that we do? Ultimately, we should be seeking to please God in all that we do. His approval really should be all that matters in the end. Not to please people. Not to try to chase people's smiles or avoid their frowns, as one preacher said. But to please God in all that we do. That should be our only goal in life. Um, To have, as the old way of stating it was, to have an eye single to thy glory. To be first and foremost concerned with pleasing God in what we do. Because after all, what does it matter if the whole world is pleased with you, but God is not? And if God is pleased with you, who cares if the whole world is against you? Uh, Paul says, we aim to please God and no one else. And that was what we should cultivate as our motive. His motive was pure to please God. His motive was pure to benefit God's people. He talks about that in verses 5 through 8. And again, he begins with the things he did not do. Which is exactly what the the cranks and the crackpots would do when they would come through. He said, we didn't come with flattery. Proverbs 29.5 calls flattery a net that we spread in front of others. You spread the net with flattery and then you trap them in it. Paul said, we never came and flattered anyone. That wasn't our ministry. Um, We didn't preach as a pretext for our own greed or covetousness. He said, we didn't try to get anywhere by lies and we didn't try to tell the truth for our own personal gain. We didn't seek glory from anyone. That didn't motivate what we did. He said, in fact, we didn't even insist on the things that were our rights to have. Um, Paul teaches us elsewhere that those who labor for the gospel are worthy of being supported by those for whom they labor. But Paul said, you know, knowing how many cranks and crackpots come through for their own benefit, one of the things that we particularly didn't do was assert our rights in that way. We didn't ask you to support us. We supported ourselves. Because we didn't want anyone to be able to say that we're doing this for our own gain. That we're profiting off of the people we came to minister among. And that was particularly true of the Macedonian churches that tended to be much poorer than some of the other churches. 
He said, we didn't do any of those things. We didn't flatter you. We didn't preach for greed. We didn't seek glory. We didn't even insist on our own rights. But what did they do instead? He uses another metaphor. First he said we were like faithful servants. Now he says we were gentle and loving like a nursing mother who cares for her own children. What a wonderful contrast between the con artists that were abroad in the world um, and a mother who cares for her own children, who's motivated only by love for them. Paul says, you know, we didn't come to get something from you. We came to give something to you. We came to give of you of the gospel. We came to give of you of God. We came to give of you of ourselves. Um, Paul says our motivations were pure. We didn't come to take anything. We came to give everything. We gave even ourselves. Right? Verse 8, we were, not, we were ready to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves because you had become very dear to us. They are motivated by love. Love for God and love for neighbor. A love that gives. Um, there too is what we should strive for in God's service. There are so many ways to go wrong. It's one thing that, that pastors struggle with, that seminarians we try to teach as, as their thing. There are so many ways to go wrong in God's service. So many t temptations to trip us up. And there are times when it's even wrong to insist on your own spiritual rights. It's a difficult calling to be Christians in this world. But we never go wrong if we give of ourselves in love for the benefits of our brothers and sisters. If we seek to serve our God and we seek to serve others, we'll never go wrong in giving ourselves for their sake, um, in, in loving them. And we know that when we do that, we'll experience what the saints in all ages have experienced. That when we exchange worldly wealth for wor and power and worldly glory, we will receive worldly poverty and worldly weakness and worldly disrepute of all kinds. It's what happened to our Lord. It's what happens to his servants. But what we lose in the world, we gain much more spiritually. And that's what Paul found. There was nothing he gave up that he didn't get much more in spiritual return. Think of what he says in 2 Corinthians 6, 8 to 10. We are treated as impostors and yet are true, as unknown and yet well known, as dying and behold we live, as punished and, not yet, and yet not killed, as sorrowful, yet always rejoicing, as poor, yet making many rich, as having nothing, yet possessing everything. They were learning what it is to be like Jesus. That's the blessing that comes to those who pick up their crosses and follow him. They find what Paul found. They find what Jesus promised. That whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave. Even as the Son of Man came not to serve, to be served, but to serve. And to give his life as a ransom for many. When we give of ourselves for the Lord, for the benefits of our brothers and sisters in Christ, we're following the example of the Lord. We're working from pure motivation. And finally and briefly, Paul talks about the righteous ex exertion that they did on behalf of the people. Uh, verses 9 through 12, Paul answers the last criticism of the efforts that they had undertaken on behalf of the church. Um, he ends here in verse 9 by saying, For you remember, brothers, our labor and our toil. You remember how we worked. You remember how we worked night and day. They worked to make their own living during the day, and they shared the gospel many times at night, um, working day and night for their sake. And why? Again, so that they would be a, not a burden, but a blessing to the church, so they could give more and more 
to the church. They didn't want anyone to have doubts about why they were working. And in doing so, they showed themselves to be true servants, holy, righteous, blameless before God and men. And Paul uses his last metaphor. In the midst of all the crackpots and cranks that came through town, they showed themselves to be faithful servants, like loving mothers and like caring fathers. Being guiding fathers is the last image that he uses of how he ministered among them. That we showed you the care of a father in your instruction, telling you what you needed to hear in the way that you needed to hear it. That he exhorted them when they needed exhortation. That he encouraged them when they needed encouragement. That he charged them what to do when they needed to be charged with what to do. And that's the good kind of fatherly instruction. That's what good fathers know what to do. They know, they know when and how to use the authority they've been given by God. When they need to be compassionate and when they need to be authoritative. They do it at the right time, in the right moment. And Paul says, that's how we exerted ourselves among you. Like caring fathers telling you what you needed to hear so that you could live a life worthy of God and the calling you've received. Because they, they were good and caring fathers because they knew to whom they were ministering. Those who'd been called to be a part of God's kingdom and his glory. That's what allowed them to love their congregations like loving fathers because they understood who they were people who had been called by God to be part of his kingdom and his glory. And this is how they labored among the people. This is how they defended their ministry. There were many swindlers and rogues, crackpots and cranks that passed through Thessalonica in Paul's day, but he and Silas and Timothy were none of these things. They were messengers of the gospel sent by Lord Jesus Christ faithful servants, loving mothers, guiding fathers, proclaiming Christ effectively from pure motives and righteous exertion to save those who are dying. May the same be true of us by the grace and spirit of our God, that we would labor in this way for people in the world who are called to God's kingdom and his glory. Amen. Let's pray together. Father in heaven, we thank you for this word and we thank you for the faithful testimony of these gospel ministers. Whether they could appeal to what the people had seen among them and could appeal to them and, and argue that their ministry was effective. We thank you that you make the weakness of what we do effective by the grace and power of your Holy Spirit. And we pray that we would always operate through the purest of motivations that we would act to please you and you alone and to benefit your people and that we would labor and that we would remember for whom we are laboring, those who are called to your kingdom and to your glory. And would you give us the right words to speak at the right time that we might minister to the world too as loving fathers who say what need to be said for the benefit and the good of our children. Lord, we know that these things are beyond any of us to do in our own strength. But they are possible in the strength of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the power of his spirit. We pray that as we meditate on these things, we might think of the perfect example of them we have in our Lord Jesus Christ. Who came into this world and was effective in his ministry. Who was motivated only by a love for you and a love for your people and who exerted himself day and night for our good, and ever lives now to intercede for us at your right hand. We thank you for his ministry. We thank you for that ministry that continues to go forward in his name. May we be faithful. And hear us, we pray in his name. Amen.